Hello, people. Welcome, welcome. We are going to go ahead and get started here. I hope everyone's doing well out there and is excited for another Zoom discussion. I'm personally very excited for this one. Uh, today we're talking about characters and character development, specifically within the realm of feature films. Um, and I don't think we could be joined by two more appropriate writers for this subject. We've got Adele Lim, prolific prolific TV writer and producer, uh, but I have a hunch you probably know her best as co-writer of 2018's Crazy Rich Asians and the upcoming Disney animated feature, Raya and the Last Dragon. Even though I know nothing about that movie, I'm over the moon excited for it. <laughs> and we've got Mike White, writer of Pick Your Favorite Here, Chuck and Buck, Orange County, School of Rock, Nacho Libre, Brad Status, and perhaps uh, most formative for me, The Good Girl, which my sister and I watched more than 50 times one summer back in the DVD age. Um, <laughs> wow. I'm like surprised. It's really good. Um, so I'm giving you both a massive round of applause on behalf of everybody who's here. Uh, I don't think I'm alone in this. These conversations have been like school for me during quarantine, um, and I've just so been looking forward to talking to you both. Uh, just to give everybody a little bit of background and context, I am Lauren O'Connor. I'm a librarian at the Writers Guild Foundation Library. We have a collection of 45,000 film and TV scripts and an archive of writers' papers, as well as other collections that document the history of the WGA West. Uh, and we work to serve writers. Um, and I'm assuming everybody here is you know, probably a writer. Uh, when there's not a pandemic going on, people can come in and read scripts and learn the craft. Uh, and the reason I'm so excited about this discussion is that my favorite part of the craft, my favorite part of watching movies, uh, the thing that makes them appeal to me and stick with me is the characters. Um, and I think there are probably particular considerations when developing characters for a screenplay for a feature film as opposed to other mediums. Um, so I'm glad we're here to kind of unpack that process a little bit. Um, and one final note for everybody here, um, as part of this webinar, um, you can use the chat box if you want to talk amongst yourselves and share resources while this is going on. Um, but if you have a specific question, um, you should see a little Q&A button down there at the bottom. That's where you'll submit those. Um, and just be forewarned, to me, it's a lot like patting my head and rubbing my stomach uh, to try to parse through questions while we're going through this. Um, so I hope you can forgive me if we don't get to your question, um, but my colleagues will be sending me texts reminding me to look at the Q&A box. Um, so with all of that in mind, uh, I hope everybody's ready uh, because that's it for my opening remarks. And um, but let's just start with like, how are you guys doing? Thank you, thank you so much for being here. We just like really, really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Like I put on like, I put on like an outfit today. Like yeah. I washed my hair this morning. So it's a big treat. I know I didn't, I didn't do... have to, I brushed my teeth, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh <No>. my God. <laughs> I didn't put on an outfit or wash my hair, but. Yeah, I noticed that Mike, nice going. <laughs> I did wash my hair, but then I, I ran around, so I'm a little, I don't know, it's a little sweaty. It looks great. Okay. It looks okay. <laughs> All right, so we're ready to talk about character development. Um, I feel like uh, a good place to start, or I like to start with like <clears throat> formative experiences. Um, so my first question for you guys is, um, do you remember some of your initial or early in life favorite characters? from you know films or books or tv shows or like do you have any all-time favorite influential characters <laughs> you want to go uh all time oh my god I, well it's hard because when you talk about formative years i grew up in malaysia and so it wasn't a lot of movies we and we got everything super late like i'm not that old but we got all like you know, the amazing, amazing early 80s TV shows like Manimal and Auto Man and, you know, and, like, and I thought it, I thought they were the bomb. Like, I thought it, it was like freaking everything I ever wanted. Um, but really, it was, I think, again, early 80s TV, I think Wonder Woman probably like imprinted on me in a, in a serious way. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, when you talk about like character depth or whatever, like, I, I don't think my six-year-old Malaysian girl brain cared a lot about that. But it made a huge impression. Um, and I think, you know, beyond that, it was probably mostly from books, like um, 
grew up reading a lot of Woodhouse mm. and a lot of Irma Bombeck, weirdly. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, that voice you know, stuck with me. Yeah, I remember, uh, like, you know, like, I remember, like, Alice in Wonderland, where, like, the characters were so weird and had these, all these, it was, I mean, it was, like, both, they were, like, really up tight about manners, but then they were all crazy, and I was, like, that's so funny, and I just, like, I just, liked always liked characters that were so, I don't know, like, where you felt like your imagination was expanded by like thinking about that character and funny characters and and I also remember like when I was young there was that play like Edward like I don't know how I the, what happened was I, I had a second grade teacher who was the mother of this playwright Sam Shepard who was also an actor mm -hmm. and so he had written you know he like won a Pulitzer Prize for playwriting or something and so I like would read like his I didn't understand him I was young and, and I just but like there was always like it was always people getting drunk and then telling their secrets. And you know, the secrets were always like, like there's a body buried in the yard or like they were like all horrible to them. And they, you know, like there's all some, you know, and like, so I was like that, like this, like characters that like, I would like order cocktails and get drunk and, you know, spill their secrets. And I like, as a kid, I was like, is this what adults do? Like, is they, just, they all get drunk and like kill babies and bury them in the yard? <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and well, and just to like dig a little bit further, um, and I'm asking this because I think it's important, you know, for, for writers um, to think about what kind of tugs at their feelings and their emotions. Um, when you're watching a movie or reading someone else's script, um, what kinds of like character traits or qualities do you find yourself latching onto? Oh. That's an interesting question. I feel like, you know, I have such commercial taste and, you know, a lot of times when you're developing, particularly when you're um, developing like um, um, a pilot for TV, you know, they want to get into that, the kind of character, like the depth and, you know, the choices, how they're flawed and how they're going to grow, you know, and it all becomes like this weird algorithm, like you're plugging this thing into. But if I'm just watching, you know, I'm just drawn to characters that I'm excited by, you know, and when, when you're coming up, and it's one of two things. Sometimes, you know, they're the, they're these most, more often than not, they're these larger than life characters. And then they have like, you know, some of your flaws. And you're just like, I, I can see that. I can identify that. But mm -hmm. really, I, I'm, I'm kind of more drawn to the characters that I don't identify with at all, but had all these secret fantasies of like, God, I wish I could live as that character. Sure. Um, I was just watching like, um, you know, like K-drama is a big thing now. And I've been like, you know, I, I went down like a huge K-drama uh, rabbit hole because, you know, like the rest of the world is consuming it like nonstop. Like people are binge watching like 40, 80 episodes of these things. And so like I got into it and there's one called Itaewon Class right now that's on Netflix. Hmm. And there's a female character on it who's like, you know, they, they get deep into like the backstories and you follow these characters over 20, 30 years. And she was like, you know, diagnosed like borderline sociopathic, you know, and then, you know, you, you just follow her through and she is not someone you relate to at all. But being right. able to sort of indulge this sociopathic, insane sort of like age driven thing, you're just like, I want to be her. Like, I want her as a friend. I want to just live <laughs> like her for two seconds, you know? So, and I find like, those are kind of the characters I'm kind of drawn to when I'm reading too, you know? Sure. Um, and and to, that, that's like totally a personal taste thing, um, mm -hmm. you know? Probably less as a contemplative, like, you know, deep, like internal character person. Awesome. <laughs> Mike? <laughs> he's he's in that? it. <laughs> he got lost in, <laughs> in a reverie. Uh, I was just thinking, like, what I was actually thinking about when you were talking about was like, I was just read this script recently that a friend was directing, and it was the kind of characters that aren't interesting to me. I don't know. It was because like everything felt very like canned, like in the character, the voices felt very sort of, it felt like all of the voices were the same voice. Like it, there wasn't real differentiation and, and you know, it's, it was a much more like kind of, you know, genre type of movie. So, but like you sort of, I don't know, like, so I guess it, in contrast to that, like, I just like characters where you feel like there's something alive on the page that like feels like life, like that, you know, it feels, it feels, um, I don't know, like 
there there's some uh you, you know human like and, and i find people in real life are never just one thing you know they're often you know they're you know and they they can be funny and they can be you know self-pitying and they can be a, lot, a bunch of different things and it's like you want you know you at least for me i aspire as a writer to try to yeah make the characters as interesting as as you know that they stay interesting to me and that they are expansive as opposed to just like one idea you know right but to, to what you said of it sounding interesting i feel like you know, and I see in one of the questions here, it's like, do we write extensive character bios? You know, when you're pitching something, you know, they, there is this whole thing when you pitch or when you're trying to sell a project of like, you know, the character's background and, you know, they were abused at four and then, you know, worked in like a disabled horse farm for three years and it really imprinted on them. But then on the page, they, you know, to my point, like they all kind of sound the same. Like they sound like, you know, at any boring person you run into in, at Starbucks and, you know, there's how they present, even though they've come up with this, the writers come up with this like super rich background for this character. It, the way they present, it's just sort of, it's sort of like, Meh. right, <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. right. It needs to be, yeah, in the in the action, in the in the you know, it it yeah, the having the backstory is not good if it's not enough if it, if the yeah if the way it expresses itself is boring on the page or not interesting in the in the in the dialogue and that behavior. For sure. Um, so my next question would be, um, when you're writing a script, where's the first place that you start? Do you start, I mean, that's like the eternal question. It's like, do you start with character or do you start with plot? Um, what are the first questions you find yourself asking um, to build a character and you know, build a story? I mean, for me, it definitely starts with character and a situation that the character is in <clears throat> and building it around that like I'm not a you know plot is you know I I try to have good plots but like it's not it's like I, I it, you know it, it, a lot of it is character driven stuff that I'm writing so you know I think the times when I get the most excited to write is when I'm like kind of like whatever channeling a type of you know per, like a character that like feels like it you know, it's not me, but something that I feel like I'm, I'm one, you know, excited to express through this character, some qualities or some kind of situation. And, and, you know, like, I just remember, like, I did a show called Enlightened, where Laura Dern was the, um, played the star of it. And she, and I, I just had this idea of, like, you know, sometimes people are so happy, it, like, makes you nervous, or, like, they're so excited excited that like they it's like it, it can like make you like run away and I just was like that's a funny character like somebody who's just like you know like they're so gushing and warm and you know like that's like and like everyone is running from them you know uh, and I just felt like that's a funny kind of character to get at because they're hopeful and optimistic but like somehow it still is like having the wrong intended effect uh, but just a, a love shout out to Lion there was this thing where she's like you know you have like this super upbeat character, but in her setup, there's a thing where she like fucking loses it. And then she like rushes at the elevator and she's like prying it apart. Her eyeliner is like streaming down and she's like freaking the fuck out. And I remember thinking like, it me, like that, that's me on any given Wednesday, um, you know, on like out of my writer's room. Um, but so you like get the whole character, like you buy the, the, yeah. The, the happy kind of you know like super sunshiny side of it you you know that is what's fueling all that sunshiny energy right um, well it's like but, it's kind of like I remember like Tom Cruise in interviews where he'd be like <laughs> and he'd be like right underneath it it's like he, there's like are you angry or what's happening like it's, I don't know <laughs> uh, but uh, to get you know I, I think similarly like it comes you know it's it starts from character um, I'm not I've always been like a crap procedural writer. So, you know, not good with like, oh, this is the amazing, like, you know, twisty, turny plot. And this is the character I'm going to plug into that. I think um, in like the, the, la the last like original pilot I created, I was in this like, I was in a super angry headspace of just like raging against the world. I just like so much agita. And, um, and generally like it's helpful because, you know, like writing's hard writing like you know it's an ass bleeding a lot of the time and so like if you can just like use it as kind of like therapy to like push all your stuff into it's helpful so I, again I had so much rage so 
um, I met with a production company who wanted to do a thing on community policing. And I was like, okay, that is a world I can plug my angry bitch female character into, you know? And so I came up with this thing of, um, and, and again, like woman in a man's world and just raging at the state of things. So I made her like, you know, black female, um, you know, uh, um, police captain who sort of goes back to her, um, you know, hometown in Detroit. And, you know, has to like put up with all kinds of shit from her family, from the world, from like just the general thing and all these pressures facing her. So even though I have no, I don't know what Detroit, you know, I um, have not spent a lot of time in Detroit. I don't know what it's like to be a black woman, but I feel like, you know, I, the, the core, like the, that core fusion thing that's driving her like that, that I know. So, you know, that I had some sort of like North Star sort of like telling me what this character would do, what she would think, you know, what ridiculous shit should she pull on any given moment, um, you know, so I could orient myself. Sure, yeah. Um, well, and that, that seems like a good segue um, into the other question I have. Um, I just wanted to address, you know, like both of you, um, you know, work in TV, have worked in TV. Uh, in your mind, what are some of the key differences or similarities um, developing characters for TV versus developing them for, you know, like a feature screenplay? Or is, does it just kind of come down to economy? like you know how much time you have or um well i would just say my 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 experience in features is somewhat limited i only jumped got into it like crazy rich was my first one mm -hmm. um but just in my experience so far with it with tv you know you just you have to come up with like the, a compelling character right off the bat that you want to follow um and then you have a ton of time you have you know you have your whole season and you know in the best case scenario years to kind of develop that character and go places with it and in features, there's like a very firm sort of like beginning, what's your midpoint, what's the end, you know, and it all needs to be like compressed right within then you, and you answer the question at the end, there's no leaving it open ended. Um, right. So I guess that's that just like, um, I feel like TV is so much more compressed in all other ways, but in this one aspect, like for film, you know, you just have to start and end the story right there. Right. Yeah, I that's yeah, I, I'd say something similar. Is it? It's, it's a uh, it's <clears throat> you feel like with tv you're basically you need to do a little bit of what you're talking about for where you, you have a backstory you say there's a rich character and you're gonna get to it yeah. <laughs> <You'll> get to <laughs> later it's yeah. like you'll get to some of it in the pilot but it's like you know you want to feel like you you're building out a character that has a rich world to explore but you're not gonna it's a lot of it is potential it's not you know in the movie you have to it's got to be right there and it has to yeah fit a, a feature life length plot <clears throat> yeah, and also just to, to add on to that, like I, you know, I'll just fully admit I'm a huge TV writer's bias because that's the majority of like my career. But I remember watching, you know, following like uh, Six Feet Under the whole way through, and then we got to the Six Feet Under finale, and that like haunted me for days. Like you, re you really felt like you lived a lifetime with these characters. And, you know, and I remember thinking like that, you know, you would not be able to pull that off in film, but, you know, it's, it's its own challenge. Right, right. Well, and it's, it's cool um, to talk to both of you at the same time, because between you, um, you've written on all the great coming of age shows, like Dawson's Creek, Freaks and Geeks, One Tree Hill. Um, I, I was just wondering, like, from working on those teenage shows, uh, did you learn anything about, you know, character arc or character development and kind of that, like, heightened growing up world? I think, what's fun, really about, <laughs> yeah, sorry. I think what's fun about, like, the, t the young coming of age type of shows, it's similar to, like, office shows, is that you can populate, you know, you can really orchestrate it with, a, you know, you can draw on different you know, different kinds of voices. And if you like to write different kinds of voices and, and channel different sides of yourself through all those voices, it's a rich place to do that. You know, uh, uh, I think sometimes like, yeah, if it's more like, you know, family show, you know, where it's like, you feel like everybody's a little bit from the same world and they're, you know, they have the same kind of situa situation and you're more tied into a certain kind of, um, so I liked writing, you know, like on those shows, it was kind of fun to, uh, yeah, do the different voices, but yeah. Yeah, uh, I think what I found with, you know, writing on like the CW kind of shows, 
there are two things you can do with coming of age or like young people shows that you can't really do even with young adult shows or adult shows. Like you can be way more earnest. You can just sort of like, you know, they, everything's kind of like your Disney heart song when you're a teenager and the stakes are there. And for the viewers, they get it. Like whether it's the OC or like One Tree Hill or, you know, the, or Dawson's Creek. Um, like we all remember being that age and we all remember how like, you know, the first kiss has that kind of weight to it. Your first sexual encounter, your first like, you know, bad turn at a bar, your first like, you know, we feel all of that in a way that we don't even, you know, when characters get to college. So like that, that's always, that's always fun. And the, the fun part about being in a writer's room for those shows too, it's everyone unpacking all their damage. Um, so I feel like, you know, even for like heightened, you know, young adult shows, there, even if it feels like kind of earnest that there is this authenticity and this like, you know, this genuine kind of pull and uh, authenticity to it. <laughs> totally, <laughs> totally. Um, well, and, and since you mentioned, um, you know, everything kind of feels like your Disney heart song, um, you just wrote a movie for Disney. Um, <laughs> And so I, um, the thing for me that makes, you know, Disney animated films so endearing, I would argue is characters. I mean, that's, that's what you remember. That's your emotional connection to, you know, those stories. Was there anything that you learned from, from doing a movie there um, about things that are kind of emotionally and universally appealing um, that you might yeah. like take to other projects? Well, I mean, yeah, and Mike's worked on like a, um, an animated, like you, a movie too they uh, with Disney with Pixar like they they have it sort of like broken down to a fine science and even then it's still insanely difficult you know mm -hmm. like when you're when you're onboarding with them they have like this is how your character starts you know it's a kind of a sort of a perfect world and then like the it's the best thing ever and then the worst thing ever happens and then they have to go on this journey um and the, the difficulty, and you see it more pronounced with a Disney movie, you know, because it really has to appeal to everybody, but it's really primarily for, for kids, um, is that it's hard to have a character who's the most interesting character, but also is the most, inter uh, you know, the most interesting character, but also your lead character, because your lead character for a Disney movie, for an animated movie, can't be a, a total dysfunctional jerk the way they can be for, you know, um, a movie for grown-ups. And right. so what tends to happen is you have this inter character that's interesting in your head, but then all the side characters start to become more interesting because they can, they can be villainous or ridiculous or like unapologetically like narcissistic, you know, and, and you find, you know, when you're what, reading it or watching it, like you're drawn to those other side characters, whereas your, your perfect, amazing lead character who has to sell a bunch of like, tea, uh, you know, Disney Halloween costumes and be this aspirational figure suddenly becomes less interesting. And so then your job as a writer or, or you know, a part of that uh, creative team is to really kind of push it. Like, how can we make this character like, you know, a Disney lead at the same time, you know, the most compelling. Yeah. Um, and, and also like, you know, not to take up too much space on it. I think the the interesting uh, discovery for me on Raya and the Last Dragon, because we have this like kick-ass young uh, female uh, teenage heroine in the middle of all of it. When we were looking at comps for that specific character, when you get into um, action female characters, they all tend to kind of break down the same way. Um, you know, whether it's Rey on Star Wars or Furiosa from Mad Max or Lara Croft, like what we realized, first of all, you're hot as hell. And two, like you can't crack a joke or smile or, you know, just, you know, just be particularly engaging. Like they're, they're amazing to look at, but I don't know if you want to hang out with them. And it, it wasn't until like, getting deep into it where I realized like, oh, the closest comp might be like Xena Warrior Princess, <laughs> you know, where, you know, um, so when, again, when it came to like certain character types, I feel like there, there are certain characters in Hollywood that have kind of gotten the short shrift and, you know, and so it just takes a little bit, it takes a little bit more just to kind of like crack it because you're not sure like what the comps are, you know, what you're allowed to get away with, you know, with a young female character who can do all these things and carry all that water. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so that's my very long answer. No, that's great. Well, and Mike, I mean, I, I know you just wrote the script for uh, the one and only Ivan, which is like a family oriented film. Uh, do you have anything kind of like um, piggybacking off of that or anything you learned from that? Um, about character building. I, um, yeah, it, it's, a, it, I mean, I can uh, relate to Adele as far as feeling a little hamstrung, like it, it, it was a little harder to um, 
yeah, bring a little bit more of the ex, like some of the idiosyncrasy that I like uh, to some of the stuff because it's, you know, there's very, uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of anxiety now more than ever. I think even more than when I was a kid, I just watched the original Willy Wonka movie and it's like those kids are so like, I mean, they're literally sent to their deaths through the whole movie. It's like, you think they're <laughs> dead. And I'm just like, I just wonder like how, yeah, I, I just, it's like, there's a, there's a, yeah, just an anxiety that permeates all of the converse, the development conversations of like, is this too mean? Is this, blah, 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 blah. you know, like, and at some point you just kind of, you know, you, I go back to like Alice in Wonderland and that, those books and like Alice, it was not just, they were all eccentrics, but she was crazy. I mean, yeah. she was always offended or like, like it was like, she was like, she, it wasn't like she was like this perfect little, you know, like it was like she had a unique, voice you know she was an oddball in a way and she was always like you know like she was she was kind of haughty and a little you know like and but and funny and weird but whatever so yeah it just it seems like it's like it's a little bit more everything needs to yeah work for this kind of uh ghost audience that's gonna you know tends to be and I guess people are really you know I guess careful about what their kids see and stuff so it's for, and and um, I know there's there's a lot. I'm noticing a lot of questions about kind of like building out um, the ensemble of characters. But I wanna I wanna um, I wanna ask a question first um, about protagonists, um, since we're kind of talking about that um, anyway. Um, as a writer, um, what do you what do you need to get into that main character? Um, what do you need before you can start putting them down on the page? Do you find yourself taking like personality tests or journaling as the character? Or what, what do you, um, how, how do you develop your lead? You're making me feel bad for not doing any of that stuff when I come up with a <laughs> character. That's your answer. Yeah. Um, no, and I, you know, I, I, I think the difficulty for me is this, and, I, and it might be, you know, the limitations of my imagination. Like, I, I need to, I personally just need to be able to lock into that character somehow. And it's, you know, incredibly narcissistic, but I, I have to, I have to relate something about that character in me. Um, mm -hmm. And there was something um, Jason Kadem said about Friday Night Lights, which really stuck with me, was, you know, he's talking about Jason is like this lovely like Jewish guy who you know like lives in Malibu is like into Bruce Springsteen super touchy feely and he has to write about this football coach in Texas and he was like I don't relate to that character at all but when you look at the character's journey he talked about how you know it's this new coach moving into this town where football is everything and he's the new guy and feeling all that pressure and he was relating it to him kind of like going into this project and you know, like, and similarly, I feel like with with the characters um, um, I'm writing, whether I've come up with them or I'm, I'm adapting them for something, like finding something in their journey that I can really relate to, and so, and you know, and at least bring that um, that side of my experience into it, so mm -hmm. I don't have to, you know, and, and maybe it's like a shortcut, you know, lazy way of, uh, of approaching it, but then it feels like I have an instinct for what that character would think or do, um, or react to. Um, versus having, you know, because you do a ton of research, you do all, the, you know, you talk to a bunch of people. I think that's the, the other aspect too, of just like speak, talking to a lot of people who've actually lived a similar life to your character, if not the, the actual person itself, because like real life just is always, it's always like so much richer and crazier than you can, than anything you can come up with on your own. Absolutely. No. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. Like for me, it's, it's always connecting to some <clears throat> part of me that I'm wanting to get at through the scripts. It's like, I wrote that movie, this movie Brad Status and Ben Stiller plays this character. He's just always like, I don't know, jealous, like envious of people and like competitive and feeling like, and, and, and the weird like wormholes you get into when you think about everybody in those terms. And I was like, you know, like just to do a pure, a character really is pure. I mean, that's a part of me, but that's like a, like, it's like if I really just like went all the way there, like that's what, you know, could come out of that. Or like, you know, like with the good girl, she was always just like, it was, it was yeah, an existential, like she's never satisfied with anything. And like, and what happens when a character is like, you know, like if, if you just kind of like go all, you know, so it's, so usually it's some side of yourself that you're, 
I don't know, you feel like it's percolating for some reason in that, in that period of your life and then just letting it go full, like really like be the full version of that as opposed to watered down with all the other things that you are. For sure. Um, and then in terms, of, in terms of raising the all important stakes, um, are you sitting there making lists about the worst possible thing that could happen? How do you come up with situations that are really going to put your character through the ringer and um, show us what they're made of, so to speak? I mean, that to me is always the big, you know, challenge is to, to get a plot that really works and has a, you know, it has builds on itself and allows the character to continue to you know either show that side of themselves that is their issue or somehow to grow from whatever happens and and you know that's each you know it's like it's like each i think of every script as like it, an equation and it's like every time you think oh i've got to figure out that equation and you realize each is its own equation it's a new equation every time it's a new uh and so you know, sometimes you, yeah, it's like, I, I wish there was like some simple <laughs> equation you could give to everything, but like each, each one has its own, um, is its own riddle to solve, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, and this is for everybody too, because again, you're, you know, what we do, we never just create it by ourselves. There's always executives and other people and producers and it, the stakes question always, always comes out. And so they're like, okay, this part of our formula, we gotta like, you know, feel the stakes. What's gonna happen? What is she gonna lose if she doesn't do this thing? And I think for me is, um, uh, the stakes just have to feel real. Um, you know, they, cause a lot of times like, you know, to, to satisfy that thing of, um, you know, giving them stakes, we're like, if she doesn't, you know, get to this town in town, she's going to lose her cake shop. And, <laughs> you know, and I think a lot of us can sort of like fundamentally feel, we're just like, does she really give a shit about the cake shop? Why give a shit about her cake shop? Just because, you know, it sort of like fits the equation. And so it, it's this thing of like the, the constant, um, balancing act of like understanding that it needs to be done. But, um, you know, also just, you know, just trying to make it real, like trying to make people feel it. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then um, when you're writing a character, how, uh, how cognizant are you of their arc and how much they change? Um, are, you, are you kind of keeping tabs on the minute way, you know, the character changes in each scene? Um, if so, like, how do you keep track of that? Um, and, and my, my, maybe what I'm really asking is, um, do you have to know where they end up before you start? Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely think <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, the, I, I'm not too schematic along the way. I mean, sometimes it depends on what, you know, it's like if it's a Disney movie, there's gonna be a lot more of a, yeah, there's gonna be a lot more people breathing down your neck saying, you know, what, is, you know, like there's gonna be a lot more pulling apart those things. You know, my sense is like, sometimes that ends can feel a little schematic in the, you know, in a, the way it's uh, enacted, but I, but I, but having a place for it to, somewhere for it to go is, you know, I think crucial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. You, you need to know where you need to know where you're going with it. And it's going to change like it's going to change probably like a dozen times. But you know, um, and, and I think it's related to your other question of like, you know, are you creating like the world, the story, your character, like, I think it's it all just kind of just develops as you go like, um, a lot of times, like, especially if you're selling something, like, you spend all this time, like, the backstory, the thing, the potential, and then this will happen, it'll be so great, and blow open the world for this character, and then you start writing it, and the character wants to kind of do her own thing, and, you know, and suddenly you realize, like, it, the things that I want her to do sound really forced and terrible, and it just sounds like a bad network note or something, right. um, and, you know, and, and then there's this sort of back and forth, and then maybe the, the end goal changes, too. For sure. Um, uh, kind of like going in a different direction here. Um, the thing that's impressive about scripts by both of you is that one is never going to confuse any two characters. They all have very specific voices. Um, you're never going to confuse, you know, Rachel Chu and Astrid Young or Dewey Finn and Ned Schneebly. 
Um, I want to I want to talk about building out the ensemble um, and giving each character um, a really unique voice and perspective. Um, how do you how do you kind of approach character voice? I think that I mean to me that's the fun part of writing is honestly is that and being able to do different things. I mean like with like a movie like The Good Girl it's like I wanted them all to be dealing in a way with the same kind of existential thing just in different ways and so it's really usually I don't know the rule of thumb is kind of like it depends on how character driven your movie is but if it's like a, it's like ultimately those all those other characters are supporting your main character and so they kind of you need to bring them in in some senses to service their the main character's story and they need you know you want some yeah you want uh an orchestra it's like an orchestra you want different people do providing different sounds to the overall you know sound of the movie mm -hmm. and so that part of it is really it's like I get excited about the main character and then I start, you know, thinking about the different people that, yeah, like come into the plot along the way and what, how they can serve it and, and, and being counterpoint to her, his main character story. And yeah, that to me is when I start feeling I'm building out a world and it actually gets me, you know, when it starts to really germinate like that, that's when I feel like, okay, there's a script here, there's a movie here I want to write, you know, like this is, you know, it's, so like the voices are everything to me, it's the fun part of it. Uh, it's what I, yeah, it's why I'm, I write scripts instead of books and stuff is like, you know, the sounds and the, you know, the, the dialogue and the, and, and thinking of it as like stuff that people are going to say as opposed to just you know, just an imaginative world that you're building out, you know? For sure. Yeah, I think, um, well, I got lucky with Crazy Rich because there's a book. <laughs> there, <laughs> right. There's a, you know, the, the, the characters are there, their backstories are there, it's all kind of there for you. I think the, what we ran into though, because the, the book was so rich and amazing, but there were also like 30 different characters that we'd have to sort of like really compress a lot of them and make these composite characters. Um, and then you sort of pick and choose, like, you know, like, you know, who, who do you want, like, wh what voice is kind of missing from this equation that, that you can put into it. Um, and I think, you know, with the, um, with, with the Disney project, the same thing, like, you have your main character, she's going to go through this world. And it also comes back to conflict of, you know, in every scene, you want there to be conflict, and it's not about arguing, it's about, you know, it's sort of like, you get your characters to pop by contrasting them with somebody else. And so, then your, you know, your, your second string is just like becomes that, it becomes that uh, thing that you're pushing up against. And then being able to sort of fill out like the, the, the larger world. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun because what it does is also, um, as a cheat, it takes, it takes so much pressure off like your main character or your main two characters, you know, um, it helps, it just, I, I don't want to call it like a, like a trick, but you know, when you're having a super earnest conversation and you're talking about your deep feelings and you're just like, God, I need to undercut this thing, you know, and I, and you've got to like put in this other, you know, you can have another character sort of like chime in and, you know, sort of take that earnest curse off of it. Um, or, you know, have somebody, it, so it's not this weird, ex, like emotional exposition between, um, between two characters. For sure. Um, and, and then when you guys are, you know, sort of, sort of populating your, your orchestra, um, how much, how much are you thinking about, um, you, you know, you mentioned the word kind of like, like foil, um, and, you know, drawing the, drawing the main character out, how much are you thinking about, um, archetypes? Do you, do you think about like psychology and like id, ego and superego? And are you kind of working from that place or? Um, I'm not that deep. I'm, I don't, um, I don't uh, you know, I, I, no, and here's the thing, like, and, and I say this with, with all respect to people who do put that work into that, in, into their craft, you know, because I, we go through a lot of these exercises of like, what is the characters want versus the characters need? Well, she wants this, but actually what she needs, and she may not be aware of it, is this other thing, and then we're gonna, you know, um, play with that, um, and you know, and, and, I, and I'm sure like the whole thing of like the, the psychological exercises of putting or making your characters take personality tests is very helpful for some people. For right. me, I, I don't know. It, it's just a personal thing. I don't think they've been particularly helpful for me, um, you know, because sometimes it's, it's sort of like you're, you're still making up those answers because that character is still like this fictional thing in your head when you're taking that personality test. So I don't know if this character would really do that. 
um, you know, I think the, the interesting thing for me is like, once the characters start to sound like a little scale of a little standard of just like, okay, well, we, we got to crank this up. Like, you know, what is this heightened situation we're going to put, you know, it's like a meat grinder you put this character through and it's going to make this character like just react in a certain way. It's still her, but you know, she, yeah, she is this actuary, she is whatever, but in this instance, <laughs> <laughs> tap into that deep actuary rage she has and she's just gonna go ham and it'll still feel like consistent with that character right 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 a meat grinder wow that's uh that's pretty cool yeah. <laughs> yep. an emotional meat grinder yeah. <laughs> uh, mike what about you do you do, do you ever think about archetypes or foils or in, do you ever think in those terms uh not really i I do think it, I think of it in terms of like what I said before, which is you have your main character. Like, I don't know, like I wrote this one movie, Year of the Dog, where Molly Shannon was really, she, it was about a love, she had a love for her dog and mm -hmm. she had a love for animals and she felt very misunderstood. And so like, I felt like I put the other people in the movie were like, you know, they each were obsessed with their own version of love, whether it was like somebody was romantic love or like they loved their little kid. And then another, you know, her boss loves his work and money and, and, and how they thought she was crazy, but they all had their own obsession. And I, <clears throat> and then as I constellated, I was like, well, what would be cool is that along her journey, she ends up jeopardizing all of these people's different loves. So like she, she kind of messes up with these kids, you know, she ends up babysitting the kid and like, uh, like puts it in some weird situations or like the relationship or the boss, she starts embezzling money from her boss to help with her animal rights stuff. And, and so like some of those like ideas end up kind of giving you the plot. Uh, and so it's, so it's, you know, or like the good girl, like she's depressed. And they're all dealing with this kind of depression in different ways. It's like, you know, the, they're either into religion or like they're into, you know, like he's a stoner because he's self-medicating. So like each of the person, people were there doing, thinking of, you know, having the same issue, but dealing with it in a different way than she is, you know? And so that helps kind of as an organizing principle in a way for me. Mm -hmm. Um. And then um, I, I also want to, uh, like a big thing, again, uh, in writing um, screenplays is, you know, like writing kind of like with economy and, and getting, getting stuff across on the page as like simply and as sparsely as possible. And with that in mind, um, I kind of want to talk about character description um, and how you describe a character on the page. Um, and I was kind of reading through some of your scripts and I particularly like in Crazy Rich Asians, I'm reading here. Um, <laughs> Pike Lynn, 29, emerges in Adidas and gold sneakers, half type A go-getter, half hip hop, all attitude. Um, and then Mike, like, I, you know, I was reading through a bunch of your stuff and I noticed when you introduce characters, um, you hardly use any like adjecti adjectives or anything like that at all. Um, like Summer in School of Rock will be described as precocious or, you know, Justine in The Good Girl might, it, it was once described as like looking like a zombie, um, but it's just very minimal. Um, and I was wondering if either of you have any kind of personal philosophy behind character description. <coughs> well, my philosophy is, you know, you want the dialogue to, to, to really... <laughs> And the behavior to be able to for people to get a sense, you know, it's like, but I, but I do over the years, I've realized as a sort of a, I don't know, a shorthand, it's almost like a sales, you know, like, especially when you're writing feature stuff like a Disney or like, you know, whatever, like you fill in the blank, so, you know, a lot of times you realize that the script is a, it's a prospectus, it's a proposal. And so then, you know, it's like you want the reader to have, it really is, it, it, you know, like when I write The Good Girl, I'm writing it for me or for the director that I'm, you know, it's like, I'm not, you know, I, I'm thinking less of like the reader as I am of like, okay, this is really, this is the movie, you know, like, uh, and so I am a little more, I don't, you know, like a lot of, like trying to like, you know, write a lot of flowery language in the, you know, the action stuff or those character descriptions feel like that's not you know it's not ultimately not going to be on the screen it's really just a way to so it's really just depends on who my audience is is you know in the moment you know it's like 
a lot of times, especially if you're on a TV series, you know you're writing the script. If, if you're not the showrunner and you're a staff writer, different, you know, it's like you're writing for the, I don't know, the, the head showrunner, you're writing for the network. It's like you realize who's reading those scripts and you end up know they need to hear or what helps communicate your ideas and sometimes you have to really lay it in there and sometimes you know that that's just a waste of your time and it's not helpful mm -hmm. yeah i'd agree with that you, you know you have to understand who you're writing for um you know when you're when you're writing and you're submitting to a bunch of like um executives sometimes you get a little bit more detailed because you're sort of squeezing in your character background into it but generally i feel like i just write just enough for the reader to get a sense of like, this is how, this is how the character is going to look like. And this is how I'm going to hear her speak, you know? Um, so for them to just, it, it should be too like that helps you plug into that character and helps the reader sort of like see the movie in their head. Um, and, but I don't get into the whole, you know, um, she was like homely as a, a grade schooler, but then found herself as a teenager and now works that sexual confidence. Like I don't, I don't get into like that business. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you guys, um, speaking of like, like writing for a particular audience, do you, um, do you picture actors in your head as you write or uh, no? It depends. I mean, if there's an actor, I'm like the school of rock I wrote for Jack. So like, yeah, I picture him in it, but then, you know, the other characters I did had no idea. So it, it, it depends. Often it's helpful. Like, like enlightened, I knew Laura Dern was going to do it. So like, it helps, you know, I, that part of it is fun because you start to hear their voices. I think that's a fun part of writing on a series too, is that as the actors do it, you know, you start to really hear their, you can hear it in their voices. And it, I think it makes the writing better when you can. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, when I'm, similarly, when I'm creating, just creating, I'm, I, I don't really have like the actors in my head um, it hasn't been cast yet. You don't know. What if it's like a totally different person? Um, but I think the moment, the moment, you know, the casting is set, you know, so I think like for Crazy Rich, the moment we knew we had Aquafina, we're just like, oh, we are, you know, it, it has to be written to that. And similarly with Disney, like the second we, again, we had her, like she speaks in a very, very specific way. And she has, you know, her, she performs in a specific way and you want to get the best out of that. So you are writing to that. But that's only when I, when I know for sure, like that's happening. For sure. um, and just a side note too, like I'm just like noticing people are getting like people have questions. Are we Tons of questions? Yeah, yeah, I um this this is one um uh, this is the, here's one from the audience that I think is is good to address. Um, do you add culture slash ethnicity um the moment you start developing a character, or is that something that comes about later? Jesus, like no, like ethnicity and culture is not like. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not like coconut flavoring you add into a cake. Like that's, that's, that's your, it's, it's the whole thing. Um, mm -hmm. I, I feel like, I, I think traditionally like network um, shows the, you know, the, the whole thing of like, oh, we were trying to be inclusive and diverse, you know, so the, the lead character is still your white guy, but we're going to make detective number two Latino over here, you know, and make him from the barrio or something, you know, the, and I feel like as the audience or, or, you know, and as a person of color, you can kind of feel it. You can kind of feel when a character has been sort of like um, dealt with, with this sort of like tokenism or just like, you know, we're just going to put a layer, a shellacking of color but when the character speaks, it's still, you know, um, it's still the sort of like generic, um, I'm asking the detective quest expositional questions over here and I happen to be a person of color. Um, I think, you know, it's, uh, for me, like you start, you start that the ethnicity is part of that character. It's an, it's an um, inextricable part of that character. It doesn't need to be like you know talked about overtly the same way like i'm an asian female i don't start going like hello people it's me adele asian you know like we it's just sort of a part of the texture of your character um right. anyway i could rail about that for hours <laughs> we did a whole other panel for it yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> um and then another one um that someone asked is um how do adaptations um affect your development of characters um, so if you're adapting something that previously exists, um, what's kind of your methodology there? Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's always, uh, 
adaptations I find tricky just because there's as many, um, you know, you can't be the expert on the material. You are a expert or you are one of the people that, you know, it's like, so, so you can, you know, you can t have a take on it, but then, it, you know, especially in, 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 usually with adaptations, you're hired to do it. So it's like, yeah, everybody has, so I find that I, I'm, I feel I'm a little bit more on the, you know, it's like, uh, it's a little bit more, um, a pol like, uh, collaborative in some in some senses but I also think that it's you know I think what Adele was talking about earlier is like you know no 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 original source material just completely lends it led, lays itself out you're always trying to you know there's always either too much too little you're trying to fill it in you're trying to like you know pair it out it's its own skill set and you know it's uh I think it's it's a it's it's something I'm not as good at, to be honest. Um, well, the, I mean, the adaptations are tough, but I think, you know, where I lucked out with Crazy Rich, well, first of all, the book was super, you know, it was really rich and really fun. Um, and we were also lucky with Kevin Kwan, the author, because some authors are a lot more hands-on with, you know, they get final say and you can do this or that. And his attitude from the beginning was, I, you know, he, he, speaking as him, like, I wrote the book, you guys are doing the movie, you know. Um, right. And so he was just really sort of understanding and um, really trusting, which we appreciate it. I think the biggest challenge with adaptations is this, and particularly with Crazy Rich, the world was so fun and so rich, but most of it took place with two characters just talking to each other, you know, and everything was exposition. So it's one character describing this insane nutty world and all the character and relationship dynamics to another character. And what you have to do then is to like put it on its feet. You can't have your exact same character say all those things. You have to dramatize it and, you know, have that character like live through this crazy world versus just talking about it. And the right. other issue with um, adap the adaptation for us is like, you know, the, the, the book was such a romp, but it doesn't, the characters didn't arc in the same way that we expect in, um, a, in, a, in a comedic feature, you know, of like, your character starts a certain way, you know, and I think one of the struggles we had with the Rachel Chu character is that, you know, what, what's her damage? Like, what, why is she going on this big journey? And there wasn't some big inherent character flaw with her that we had to fix in this movie. But what we ended up coming up with, and again, we didn't um, talk about it overtly, but it was in our heads and it would just affect small little decisions, was that, you know, the, the journey of like an Asian American woman in the States today, where there's this um, compulsion to over overperform and underrepresent, you know, of always like just trying to be excellent, but not talk yourself up, but, all, but, ha but it sort of shields this deep insecurity. And so that, you know, she doesn't present as insecure, but when she goes on this journey, you know, and everybody's kind of taking pot shots at her, you kind of uncover that a little bit, you know, and you see that she gets to a certain place at the end. So even though you weren't, there weren't like clear, like, you know, milestones along the way of like, this is her insecure. This is her taking a step to overcome that insecurity. This is her fully confident at the end. Like it, it was still, you know, at least, um, you know, the subjects underneath the scenes. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, let's see, we got about five more minutes here. Um, here here's one. Um, how, um, how do you deal with, um, tough character notes, um, especially if a character is really close to your heart. Um, have you ever had to like respond to somebody who like, you know, didn't understand, again, like didn't understand the stakes or said that your character wasn't likable? Um, how do, yeah, how do you deal with, with a tough note? Not well. No. <laughs> Drinking. Yeah. <laughs> I just, uh, I don't know, like I, it depends. I mean, sometimes things, I, I, I mean, I, I, my feeling is like, if it's a good idea, I'm excited about it. So like, that's how I kind of, in my own, <laughs> I don't know, like barometer of it. But like, sometimes I'm just like, oh, I just, re I remember like on Enlightened, there was like one, like she's talking about like the, the most painful stuff of her life. And it was like, there was some lines where she was like, she was talking about how her dog died and then she, they miscarried the baby and, and she was like, the dog died, the baby died, the heart broke. This was within this one of these like uh, voiceovers. And they were like, you know, that's just so depressing. Can we take out the dog died, the baby died, the heart broke? I was like, 
no, that's the whole, no, no. And like, it was like, they were really, and they've been so cool. I was sort of like, well, uh, should I just, and I'm like, no, I don't. And I literally got shirts that said the dog died, the baby died, the heart broke. And I sent it to him just, just, just so they knew that it was so important to me. And then they still were like, ha ha, we got your shirts, but we really want you to take that out. And I was like, are you serious? So we got right to the end of the final mix. And I was like, am I going to take this out? And I was like, no, I'm keeping it in. I'm keeping it. <laughs> And then of course that ends up being like HBO throws this big premiere and they choose that episode as the episode to like premiere that night. And I was like, oh, no, cause they hadn't seen it. And so I was like, oh, they're like, I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh no, they're all going to be so mad. Like I left those lines in and there was this, like, they were going to totally, and I was sitting behind the guy who made the biggest stink over it. And then the, the scene came up and then after the, after the show is over, he turned to me, he's like, you did such a good job with that episode. He didn't even notice. And I was like, that is it. That's exactly it. It's like, sometimes he's like, no, it's, this is like, it's not, like, there's not going to be a million more people who come to this show. If I take out those three lines, like, and in the end, you don't even remember. Like, yeah. let me have my freaking oh, He remembered. He remembered. He just didn't want to make a thing of it and be like, you were right, buddy. And by the way, printing t-shirts is like the height of like fucking writer aggression. Like, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Take it up my the next time I get a bad note. Well, there you um, go. There yeah, you go. I don't deal with it that well. Sometimes, like, but I've had people be like, "Can't you, ma you know, make write normal characters who are normal?" Like, yeah. I mean, like, it goes both ways. Like, they can get lost. <laughs> with me. Mm -hmm. I I like I think of myself as being very open and very collaborative. But you know, I I, I don't think I, at this point, or maybe it's been beaten out of me after like you know seventeen years in TV like writing, but. I'm all for I'm all for taking chances or changing you know certain things about a character. If I get it, I think it makes it more interesting. I think it makes for a cooler story, like any of it. But the second I feel like you know we're doing it because somebody just had a note, um, and I and it makes me not understand it, and it makes me like angry and resentful at the whole process, and makes me think about opening a bakery in like you know the Netherlands. Then I then you push back because you know because you get a lot of notes like that where you're just like i don't even fucking understand like what this thing is anymore like you know and a lot of writers they they kind of write through that of just like oh whatever it's a paycheck it's a you know it's a thing but you, you know you can get I, I don't know about other people you can get very resentful at the project that you're on very quickly if it just becomes this weird bastard creature that you don't understand anymore so yeah, I just feel like, you know, you, you push, you fight. And, and if nothing else, it'll just tell the other side, like, you know, you're, you're going to fight on some stuff. And so, you know, maybe they can back off other things. Sure, sure. Um, so I have, um, I always ask this whenever I moderate anything. Um, my final question is always, it's related to um, my favorite playwright is August Wilson. Um, and I'm, I'm super um, inspired inspired by the way that he he was so inspired by different things he had like his like four b's which was like amiri baraka and the blues and um he had you know he had like this it, this idea that it's like you create something in like a capsule or a crucible and it all kind of comes together there and i was wondering since we're all kind of in our own capsules right now um if if you had your your little like creativity capsule what are like what are like three three things that would be in there that you're inspired by that like influence your your writing and your storytelling and i know that's like the toughest question so if it like takes a few seconds to think about it it's <laughs> oh my god <laughs> in my creativity capsule well like i think of the things that i go back to when i want to be inspired is that what you think is that what you're talking about yeah things you Things you, things you draw from, things that just kind of like live here that you're constantly taking yeah. inspiration from or motivated by. I think that, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a good question. I mean, for me, like uh, one book that I know that has really influenced me is, this sounds really pretentious, but it's uh, Leslie Fiedler's Love and Death in the American Novel, which is like kind of this weird, he's like a literary theorist, but like he talks about I don't know, and, and I always read that stuff because it's such an inspired way of, I don't know, talking about um, the tropes of American literature that movies really bo were born out of. So sometimes, you know, like when you're 
you know, going to these story meetings to like really go back to the like some of the places where some of these kind of tropes, like you know, what you were talking about with Adele, like the kind of the female tough care, you know, like all these different things and how like you know the history of the American novel really was um, uh, some of the birthplaces of some of these characters that we're still kind of doing the the fifth mimeo copied version of that character and and he writes with such a funny so like i, I it's so funny and like wicked and like and wild so that, that that would be a book that i i recommend to people to read anyway because it's just it really is like a, a fun fun read too i'm gonna order it on amazon sounds like a smart writer <laughs> thing to do like <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, my three things. Um, uh, probably a vape pen because I'm human. Um, <laughs> um, uh, probably an addition of Woodhouse. Um, he's the British writer who wrote like, you know, Jeeves and Birdie. It's, and again, not because it's the source material for all great storytelling, but it kind of reminds me, it was one of the first things I read where like, again like growing up as this girl in Malaysia like you know I read this thing and it's all about like the British upper classes and ridiculous over-the-top comedy you know in the you know freaking 20s or whatever and I it made me just like laugh so hard I peed and you know like that that joy is something I constantly try to reconnect with especially when I'm in you know one of my rage vortexes um <laughs> It, I think it's just like a good reminder of that, just to kind of like go back to the stuff that, you know, gave you joy and, you know, made you want to be a writer to begin with. Um, and the third thing, I struggled with the third thing and I realized like, I want my dog in with, in, in with me. Like I need unconditional love and support and like the loving touch of like another mammal, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See me through this. <laughs> I mean, that's a great thing to end on. Uh <laughs> Thank you guys so much. This was such a great conversation. Um, and thanks everyone for the, for the like 50 questions that we have here, but I think most of them we ended up covering, I hope. Um, anyway, um, that's all I got. Any, yeah, any final thoughts or anything? Um, stay healthy, stay safe out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just saw like a comment on like vaping is bad. I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes it is. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye, you guys.